Austin will lead us off. So uh, during my time as a Calvinist, which was a while, I would have explained unconditional predestination like this. Uh, that before the world existed, God decided to choose certain individuals for salvation and then just pass over and leave the rest of humanity in its fallen state. And it might not sound fair, it usually doesn't when you hear it the first time, that God chooses some and not others, but you've got to remember that everybody deserves hell, so those who get it are just getting justice, whereas the elect get mercy. And I'm guessing this is probably how Daniel and Timothy will explain it, but they'll get a chance to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so I think there are some problems there, but we'll move on because I think there's some bigger fish to fry and the rabbit hole goes a little bit deeper. Uh, because in Calvinism, it's not that God just permits or allows the fall and then chooses some and leaves others. Um, but rather it's that God ordains and God predestines the fall and then chooses some and elects others. So it's not just given this damned mass of humanity, what does God do, choose some and elect others? It's that God wants the fall to happen. God wants the house to burn down, as it were. Right, so he ordains it, and then chooses to graciously bust in and save some and let the rest burn. And somehow they deserve it, uh, even though God ordained that it would happen, wanted it to happen, and made certain that it would happen. Now, just to be clear here that I'm, not, I'm really not setting up a straw man to burn down, not putting words in the mouth of Calvinism, here are a couple quotes from the maestro himself, Calvin. I acknowledge that this is my doctrine, that Adam fell not only by the permission of God, but by God's secret counsel. Again, the fall of Adam was not by accident, but was ordained by the secret decree of God. So, this is the unconditional predestination that you have to believe in, says Calvin, uh, if you want to be a Calvinist. That before the world or any human ever existed, God unconditionally predestined the vast majority of humanity to eternal damnation for sins that he ordained predestined and wanted them to commit. And I do think that's the right word. We can talk about that later, though, that God creates most humans because he wants to damn them forever for his glory. Right? So God wants the world to burn down, ordains it, and then saves some and lets the rest burn. And we're supposed to call this gracious, just, and even beautiful. Right? Now, in my opinion, to call this a mystery is to make the most massive understatement ever spoken by a human being. Now, Daniel and Timothy, I think, and I think Calvin thinks, have to defend this. All right? And so as they do, you listeners, you've got to be ready for an avalanche of euphemisms. Right? They're going to be coming at you fast and quick as they try to soften unconditional predestination, and make it basically sound like single predestination, and work the words so it doesn't really sound that bad. But it is that bad, and none of the euphemisms really work because in Calvinism, no matter how much you squirm, and I understand why you do, I did when I was a Calvinist, uh, at the bottom of the barrel, most humans will be damned forever because God wants them to be damned forever. Right? Now, maybe, maybe God does have complex emotions about all this, like John Piper says, that's fair. But at the end of the day, God still wants most people to be damned forever, and that's why they will be. So. This is the unconditional predestination you have to believe in, again, says Calvin, if you want to be a Calvinist. And I think, I think Calvin himself would be ashamed of you if you claim to be a Calvinist and don't own up to it. Right, now, moving on to what I think is fairly obvious, even though really good and smart people like Daniel and Timothy disagree with me, uh, and that's that unconditional predestination, no matter how much it's softened or qualified, is completely incongruous with the God revealed in Jesus Christ. I'm of the opinion that the question behind every other question that impinges upon Christian faith is this, and Mark said it earlier, what's God like? You know, a tsunami hit Sumatra a few years back and 250,000 people died. And Christians inevitably start to ask questions about the nature of God's sovereignty and God's relationship to the world. But the question behind all those questions, the question we all are dying to know is, is what's God like? What's God like? And if there is anything that the Bible is absolutely crystal clear about, anything that every single one of us should be able to agree on here tonight, is that if you want to know what God's like, then you look at Jesus. Right? John 1.18, John 14.9, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Colossians 1.15, and perhaps most importantly, Hebrews 1.3, Jesus, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's nature. In Jesus, the glory of God shines forth so brightly that there's just no place for some hidden God lurking in the shadows with secret 
decrees. That's my opinion anyways. And so, what do we see of God when we look at Jesus? And that's a question that takes a lifetime to answer, uh, but I've only got a few minutes. And so I'll answer with a really short verse that I think says the most horrific and yet beautiful thing that humanity's ever heard, Mark 15, 24. And then they crucified Jesus. They crucified Jesus. So what do we see of God when we look at Jesus? Well, I think we see a God, a God who would rather die than give sinners what they deserve. I think we see a God who, as 1 Timothy 2, 4 says, wants all people to be saved, not just all sorts of people, all people to be saved, and then puts his money where his mouth is by being nailed to a wooden stake. I think we see a God who, as 1 John 2, 2 says, is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world and not just some of the world. And so long story short, for me, uh, the crucifixion of the God-man Jesus is what ultimately crucified my Calvinism because the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, it just, it just bursts the wineskins of Calvinism. Calvinism can't contain it, in my opinion, biblically, theologically, and perhaps most importantly, aesthetically. It reveals a God that's just too good and too beautiful for Calvinism to make sense of. Because when you've got a God who's crucified for sinners, I don't think there's a lot of space for a God who creates sinners, no matter how it's explained, in order to crucify them. You can't hold those two images together. Now, you can make the case that Calvinism is biblical, obviously. You know, uh, by which I mean it's one of the ways you can make sense of the teachings of the Bible, although I do think there's a better biblical case to be made. However, I don't think you could make the case that Calvinism is beautiful. And I think the new Calvinism has done an unbelievable job at that, but what I think has happened is a false veneer of beauty <clears throat> being painted over doctrines that just aren't that beautiful when you get down to the bottom of what's really being said. And if there is a God whose true nature and even glory, glory, is revealed in the damnation of a soul that was predestined to hell. I'm afraid I can't see how that's the crucified God of Jesus Christ.